but there's a catch. How do you feel about always being lawful? Every time I look at the Paladin, whether I'm a player or the DM, I am always blown away by the absolutely insane damage output potential and relatively high staying power compared to other classes in the game. And it's apparent that the game designers feel the same way just by looking at some of the new unearthed arcana getting rolled out. But what does stay fairly consistent is the good guy trope that most paladins fall into. As proponents of righteous smiting and fiery justice, the player's handbook itself even says that it's extremely rare for paladins to be evil. And somewhere along the way, they even imply that your paladin should almost always adhere to certain tenets that often restrict how you can roleplay your character. Yuck. This in mind, it can sometimes be hard for the paladin to fit into the party dynamic if you've got a few too many murder hobos present. Realistically, this can cause a bit of tension at the table, but I'd advise that you and your paladin view these sorts of schisms as a sort of necessary evil to accomplish a common goal. Even if it would feel fantastic to smite the crap out of that stupid rogue. What you should be mindful of for now is that paladins are often compared to a sort of fighter cleric blend that can be highly persuasive and charming. Charming. As such, when you roll up your character, you'll probably want your strength and charisma to be your two highest stats, followed by constitution to help you out with some extra hit points and maintaining concentration on spells. Dexterity should typically come next, but it's worth noting that there are some dex-based builds out there that might want to have this score prioritized more highly, and then you can usually follow that up with your wisdom and intelligence scores. From there, you'll probably want to select a species option that gives you nice boosts to the abilities you need, so ASMR, Dwarves, Half-Orcs, and Dragonborn are often great mechanical and thematic choices. Of course, you could also just use the custom origin rule from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything to assign your ability score increases however you'd like. It's totally up to you, but I think a grumpy gnome in full plate with a little beard would be pretty funny. Now, as you begin your adventure at level 1, you'll get a d10 hit die, proficiency in all armor, shields, simple and martial weapons, wisdom and charisma saving throws, and any two skills from athletics, insight, intimidation, medicine, persuasion, and religion. And in addition to all that, you'll also gain divine sense. <sighs> Smells like demon in here. Mm -hmm. Sorry. This ability will literally allow you to, as an action, sense the location of any celestial fiend or undead within 60 feet of you that isn't behind total cover. And you can do this one plus your charisma modifier times per long rest. Mostly, this will just get used to weirdly sniff NPCs and your own party members, but it could be useful in some niche situations. What you'll probably use more often is your Lay on Hands, which gives you the ability to heal a creature you touch by drawing on a pool of hit points equal to 5 times your Paladin level. Alternatively, you can spend 5 hit points from that pool to cure a target of disease or poison by utilizing the power of thoughts and prayers. Of course, it doesn't have any effect on undead or constructs because, as everyone knows, God hates robots and zomboys. At level 2, your character decides that some converts just need a little bonk before accepting your god as their own, so you get to pick out a fighting style. Defense will give you a plus 1 to AC while wearing armor, dueling will grant you a plus 2 to damage rolls if wielding a melee weapon in one hand and no other weapons, which can be pretty nice if you plan on using a shield. Great weapon fighting will allow you to re-roll 1s or 2s for damage from a two-handed melee weapon to help maximize that big damage die, and protection allows you to use Use your reaction to impose disadvantage on an attack roll against a creature that you can see other than you within five feet of you. And if you're using the optional features in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, there are even more fighting styles available to you. Blessed Warrior gives you two cantrips from the cleric spell list that you can change out as you level up, Blind Fighting grants you 10 feet of blind sight, and Interception allows you to use your reaction to reduce the damage a target would take within 5 feet of you by 1d10 plus your proficiency bonus. It's like a more useful version of protection since it always reduces the damage by at least something and doesn't require a shield, but it does still fall off a bit at later levels. Anyway, most of these are great options, and based on your paladin build, your choice should be clear enough. But level 2 also sees us unlock our spellcasting as a paladin. Finally, you can use your divine favor to do stuff other than healing the sick and tending the wounded. Boring! At this point, you'll only have two first level spell slots, but you'll get more as you go along in accordance with this list. 
As you can see, paladins are half casters, so you won't have a ton of spell slots, but many of the spells you'll have access to are damn good. And the paladin is a prepared spell caster, so you'll be able to prepare a number of spells equal to your charisma modifier plus half your paladin level rounded down when you finish a long rest. Most often, you'll want to consider having bless. Protection from evil and good. Why isn't it good and evil? God damn, that bugs me. Wrathful smite and compel duel. Best used to threaten an enemy into fighting you and then running away like a little bitch. Many of those spells will be highly dependent on concentration and you'll probably be on the front lines, so it's a good thing you invested in your constitution score. And as you may have guessed already, our spell casting ability will be charisma. This means your spell attack modifier is your proficiency bonus plus your charisma modifier and your spell save DC is that plus eight. Finally, most paladins will have some kind of holy symbol for use as a spell casting focus. Be sure to add in whatever flavor you can think of here as you'll be channeling all your magic with this thing. Now, I know I just mentioned all of these super cool low level spells you can use as a paladin, but you can forget about all that now. All you really need are divine smites. Does your party need help slaying a bad guy? Smite. Did non-believers curse your god? Smite. Did someone take your sweet roll? Smite! Using this ability, when you hit a creature with a melee weapon attack, you can use a first level spell slot to deal an extra 2d8 radiant damage. This extra damage increases by 1d8 for each spell slot level higher than 1 to a maximum of 5d8 with a fourth level spell slot. The damage even increases yet another 1d8 if the target is an undead or fiend, and on top of all that, Divine Smites can even combine with other Smite spells like the aforementioned Wrathful Smite. And it's worth noting that you can even choose to Smite after knowing what you roll, so you can save your resources until you hit that sweet nat 20 crit and dish out a ton of damage. That is an incredible amount of power for a single attack at just level two, but don't just take my word for it. Check out this epic moment in our recent live stream. Now, with our smites online and the ability to go Nova with our smites so early on, we move on to level three, where we unlock immunity to all the diseases in D&D that your DM will never use anyway. Neat. In all seriousness, what we really care about here is the taking of our sacred oath or your paladin subclass. And you might be wondering, why haven't we sworn an oath before now? Were the gods just giving us smites pro bono? It seems like a pretty good deal to me. Well, yes and no. The player's handbook states that you're basically operating as a servant to a deity or ideology up to this point, but you haven't yet put forward a specific oath by which you are bound to abide. So after striving towards the goals of some deity for two levels, you'll finally swear an oath to them because before you were just a part-time miracle worker and you still had that serving job on the weekends. With that said, you should take special care here, more than most other classes, to choose a subclass that makes sense for your character. At least by rules as written, these oaths even have an effect on how you role play your character. And abandoning your oath for any reason can cause problems ranging from losing your powers to having to change your subclass down the road at the discretion of your DM. So each of these subclass options will grant you channel divinity features that come back on a short rest, free spells specific to your oath that you will always have prepared, and other features at third, seventh, 15th and 20th level. I'll briefly touch on each available option here, but I'll also keep from going into too much detail for now. Instead, I'll be sure to link any future guides or character builds that utilize the subclass as we go along. First up, we have the Oath of Conquest, which includes paladins that seek to establish order by crushing the forces of chaos in battle as warmongers and tyrants. Many even serve the devils of the nine hells in a bid for law and order over the semantics of good and evil. So. Yeah, I might have fibbed a little bit earlier. Your paladin does not have to be lawful good. And while your oath should dictate how you RP your character, most DMs are okay with deviating from that path as well. After all, perhaps the gods employ your services as a necessary evil to aid in their cause. Talk to your DM about this for sure. But the conquest paladin is a great example of what actually is possible for the class. 
That said, this subclass specifically will get you access to great spells like Armor of Agathis, Spiritual Weapon, Fear, and Dominate Person to name a few, as well as channel divinity options that allow you to frighten creatures within 30 feet of you against a wisdom saving throw or gain a plus 10 to an attack roll before you know if it hits or misses. Later on, you'll unlock features that deal psychic damage to creatures within 10 feet that are frightened of you or any that dare to strike you with an attack. And at 20th level, you can transform into an avatar of conquest for a minute, unlocking all kinds of great benefits like resistance to all damage and additional attack when you take the attack action and crits on both 19s and 20s. And you know paladins like crits. Overall, the Conquest Paladin is certainly built for battle and carries an intriguing flavor that makes this one of my personal favorite options. If you can manage to strike fear into the hearts of your enemies, you're gonna have a lot of success here. On the flip side, we have the Oath of Devotion, a paladin subclass bound to the ideals of justice and virtue as holy warriors in service to the greater good. Undoubtedly, this is what most people envision when they think of paladins, myself included. And as you can guess, they're also one of the most heavily restricted by their tenets to not lie or cheat, treat others fairly, blah blah blah. Which can be cool on its own, but if you want to try something different, just make sure you check with your DM first. Otherwise, your holy daddy might just leave you on red, effectively cutting you off of your shiny smites. Mechanically, this subclass grants channel divinity options to, as an action, add their charisma modifier to attack rolls made with a weapon for a minute and also turn it into a glow stick, or they can turn fiends and undead within 30 feet for a minute against a wisdom saving throw, forcing them to basically only run away from you. You'll also gain oath spells that include Sanctuary, Lesser Restoration, Freedom of Movement, and Flame Strike. Later, you can act as a barrier to the Charmed effect on yourself and friendly creatures within 10 feet of you, with that range eventually extending to 30 feet at 18th level. Then become permanently under the effects of protection from evil and good at 15th level. And at 20th level, become a beacon of light as an action for one minute once per long rest, shedding bright light in a 30 foot radius, dealing 10 radiant damage to enemy creatures that start their turn in the light, and gaining advantage on saving throws against spells from fiends or undead. If your campaign puts you up against the right enemies, this subclass's features can be really potent. Otherwise, you may end up feeling a bit less impactful, but this still isn't a bad option by any means. And somewhere in the middle of these first two extremes lies the Oath of Glory Paladin. Muscly warriors of this subclass perform acts of heroism to encourage those around them to do the same. Their channel divinity options grant them extra athleticism with advantage on athletics and acrobatics checks for 10 minutes with the use of a bonus action, and the ability to distribute 2d8 plus your paladin level and temporary hit points to creatures within 30 feet of you as a bonus action when you smite. Additionally, you'll get some thematic oath spells like Guiding Bolt, Heroism, Enhance Ability, and Haste. From there, you'll gain an aura that increases your movement speed by 10 feet as well as allies that start within 5 feet of you, with that range effectively increasing to 10 feet at 18th level. 15th level sees you able to counter a successful attack against you or another creature within 10 feet using your reaction to grant a bonus equal to your charisma modifier to that creature's AC and then make a strike with your own weapon against the attack if the extra AC causes them to miss. Finally, level 20 turns you into a living legend, which represents a form that you can take for a minute that blesses you with advantage on charisma based checks, allows you to turn a miss into a hit once per turn, and re-roll a failed saving throw once per turn. Now while the Oath of Glory features a relatively underwhelming aura ability and a channel divinity option that tends to be pretty resource heavy for what it provides, it's still a decent subclass, especially if you're playing in some high level campaigns. But there is yet another way. Xanathar's Guide to Everything has brought to us the Oath of Redemption. Redemption Paladin, a holy soldier with a pacifistic heart that seeks not glory, but peace instead, and only uses violence as a last resort. This of course is one of the subclass's tenets, and a tough one to follow at that, but if you can manage to look beyond this, you'll be happy to find that your channel divinity options will aid you in this cause. As an Emissary of Peace, you'll gain a plus 5 to Persuasion checks for 10 minutes as a bonus action. And when all else fails, you can rebuke the Violent by using your reaction to force an attacking creature within 30 feet to take Radiant damage equal to whatever damage they dealt against a Wisdom saving throw for half damage. You'll also gain some Oath spells, including Sleep, Hold Person, Hypnotic Pattern, and Counterspell. 
Even beyond these four, there are some other great options here that make playing a pacifist a whole lot more viable than you'd think. Then at level 7, your aura of the guardians comes online, allowing you to use your reaction to take damage for a creature within 10 feet of you, with that range effectively increasing to 30 feet at 18th level. Later on, you'll regain 1d6 plus your paladin level when you end your turn in combat with less than half your hit points remaining, and eventually become an emissary of redemption at 20th level, granting you resistance to all damage dealt by other creatures, and automatically dishing out half of whatever damage you do take back onto the creature that dealt it in radiant form. Sure, this capstone stops working if you deal damage to a creature by any means outside of it, but this all combines into something pretty special, a viable option for being a holy meat shield for the rest of your allies that'll make you think twice before using a spell slot for smiting instead of using counterspell or something like it. It's really, really good. <laughs> Next, the Oath of the Ancients will give you an option for some idol a tree. Get it? <laughs> These paladins mix in a bit of druidic flavor with their holiness, and of course, they'll still need to abide by tenets that basically boil down to be a good person. With nature on your side, you'll get some channel divinity options that allow you to attempt to restrain an enemy within 10 feet of you in vines as an action against a strength or dexterity saving throw, or turn fey and fiends within 30 feet of you for a minute against a wisdom save. You'll also find some nice usability in your oath spells with entries like Ensnaring Strike, Misty Step, Moonbeam, and Plant Growth. But largely the best part of this subclass hails from its aura of warding that grants you and friendly creatures within 10 feet of you resistance to damage from spells, with 18th level seeing that range increase to 30 feet, 15th level will save us at 0 hit points if we aren't killed outright, leaving your paladin at 1 hit point instead, and we'll become an elder champion at 20th level, allowing allowing our paladin to transform for one minute as an action into a being that regains 10 hit points at the start of each turn, can cast paladin spells with one action casting time as a bonus action instead, and give disadvantage to enemy creatures within 10 feet against your paladin spells and channel divinity options. Considering this was one of the first subclasses we had from the player's handbook, this option is really powerful. Sure, many spells won't care about your resistance to damage via your aura of warding, but that is is an always on ability that will come in handy quite often. If you weren't sure whether to play a druid or a paladin in your next campaign, play this subclass. You will not be disappointed. Or perhaps you'd prefer to be in the service of humanity via the Oath of the Crown a paladin that serves the ideals of civilization with law and order at the forefront of their ideals and tenets. You'll start off with channel divinity options that allow you to compel another creature to battle you against a wisdom saving throw, keeping them from moving more than 30 feet away from you, or grant 1d6 plus your charisma modifier and hit points to each creature of your choice within 30 feet of you if it has no more than half of its hit points. Some noteworthy oath spells also include Command, Aura of Vitality, Spirit Guardians, and Gios. If you don't already know how much I like Spirit Guardians, you should go watch my Cleric video. Then, starting at 7th level, you can sacrifice your own health to take damage for another creature within 5 feet of you. Notably, the range of this ability does not increase later, and you can't reduce or prevent the damage you would take from this in any way. 15th level then sees us gain advantage on saving throws against becoming paralyzed or stunned, and 20th level allows us to transform into an exalted champion for 1 hour as an action, gaining resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magic weapons, granting our allies advantage on death saves while within 30 feet of us, and giving ourselves as well as those same allies advantage on wisdom saving throws. There are some good features mixed in here, but a lot of what the Oath of the Crown offers is a lesser version of something another subclass excels at. By no means is this a bad subclass, but it might be the worst one in the Paladin lineup, and you'll probably find something more powerful and just as flavorful elsewhere. This brings us to the Oath of the Watchers, which has quickly become a favorite of mine since its introduction in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Paladins of this variety keep a keen eye trained for dangerous foes from other planes that they have sworn to protect the mortal realms from. You'll gain channel divinity options that grant a number of creatures within 30 feet of you advantage on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws for a minute, or turn apparitions, celestials, elementals, fey, and fiends within 30 feet of you for a minute against a wisdom saving throw. These alone can be a powerful boon for you and your party, but your oath spells are pretty great too, with entries like detect 
Detect Magic, Counterspell, Hold Monster, and Scry. At seventh level, you'll be able to give yourself and creatures within 10 feet a bonus to initiative equal to your proficiency bonus, which gets even more useful when the range extends to 30 feet at 18th level. 15th level seemingly stacks even more potency upon our channel divinity when a creature within 30 feet succeeds on an intelligence, wisdom, or charisma saving throw by allowing our paladin to deal 2d8 plus their charisma modifier in force damage to a creature that forced that saving throw. And then 20th level turns our paladin into a mortal bulwark for one minute as a bonus action as they gain 120 feet of true sight, advantage on attack rolls against aberrations, celestials, elementals, fey, and fiends, and automatically banish creatures that they damage with an attack roll against a charisma save. This subclass has an early potency that carries all the way through the rest of the tiers of play and a flavor that is unique among other paladin options. But even this doesn't compare to the Oath of Vengeance, possibly the most popular paladin subclass in the game, and for good reason. Vengeance paladins take up a set of tenets that boil down to destroy evil no matter the cost and no mercy for the wicked. The flavor alone here is pretty badass, but the mechanics of this subclass get even better with channel divinity options that can frighten any one creature within 60 feet of you against a wisdom saving throw for having their speed for a minute instead, or simply take a vow of enmity against a creature within 10 feet to gain advantage on attack rolls against that creature for a full minute. And to aid you in hunting down the biggest baddies, your oath spells will include entries like Hunter's Mark, Haste, Dimension Door, and Hold Monster to name a few. And believe me, there are more than a few notable spells in here. At 7th level and beyond, your paladin will also be able to move half their movement speed immediately after hitting a creature with an attack of opportunity, relentlessly pursuing them with no hope of escape. 15th level bolsters your vow of enmity by also making creatures under its effects susceptible to a reaction-based attack whenever it tries to make an attack itself. And finally, at 20th level, your paladin can become an avenging angel for one minute, gaining a flying speed of 60 feet and emanating a 30-foot aura that frightens creatures against a wisdom save the first time they enter that range. This subclass is bonkers good and so easy to play. Even in early tiers of play, your vow of enmity combined with divine smites is going to trivialize encounters against big bad enemies. Couple that with features that come online later and bolster the already potent Vow of Enmity and an amazing list of Oath spells and you have one of the best and most broken Paladin subclasses for 5e. But we're still not done. There is one final Paladin to discuss and that is the Oathbreaker. Especially if you play at a table with a DM that holds you to the tenets you swear as a paladin. You'll quickly become familiar with this one. This mechanic is unique to the rules of 5e in that it allows a character to completely trade out features from their chosen subclass for this one when they fail to meet up to the expectations of their deity. But that might not necessarily be bad news. As an Oathbreaker, your channel divinity options will be replaced with the ability to take control of an undead within 30 feet of you against a wisdom saving throw or force each creature of your choice within 30 feet to make a wisdom saving throw against being frightened for a minute. Of course, your oath spells will also be replaced with a list that includes Hellish Rebuke, Inflict Wounds, Blight, and Dominate Person. At 7th level, your paladin along with any fiends and undead within 10 feet gain a bonus to melee weapon damage equal to your charisma modifier, with the range increasing to 30 feet at 18th level. Do you see where this is going? At 15th level, you'll gain resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical weapons, plain and simple. And 20th level sees you become a Dreadlord, wherein your paladin can, as an action, surround themselves with an aura of gloom for one minute, ultimately forcing any enemy that is frightened of the paladin to take 4d10 psychic damage when they start their turn in the aura. Additionally, the paladin can shroud themselves and their allies in shadow within this aura so that enemies that rely on sight have disadvantage on attack rolls. Even further, the paladin can burn a bonus action to make a melee spell attack against a creature and deal 3d10 plus their charisma modifier in necrotic damage. Yeah. Do you want a Dark Paladin? Cause this is how you get a Dark Paladin. Jokes aside, this subclass might be one that ultimately gets forced upon you, but it's definitely better than some other options on this list. The temptation might even lead your Paladin to continue their unholiness just for all the power gained at the finish line. 
But even after all these subclasses and features, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything has introduced yet another optional third level feature called Harness Divine Power. With this ability, you can expend a use of your channel divinity as a bonus action to get more smites, I mean spell slots. You'll regain a single spell slot of a level no higher than half your proficiency bonus rounded up. And you'll be able to use this feature once per long rest at third level, twice at seventh, and three times at 15th. Now, finally, we can move on to level four, where we get both an ability score improvement and the final optional rule, martial versatility. This will allow us to change out a paladin fighting style for another each time we would reach a level where we would get an ability score improvement, which happens for paladins at fourth, eighth, 12th, 16th and 19th levels. Then at 5th level we'll get an extra attack so we can fish for more crits to use our smites on. Starting at 6th level we'll get an aura of protection that grants a bonus to us and allies within 10 feet of us for saving throws equal to our charisma modifier. This ability is just fantastic. Not long after this point, there's a good chance that your paladin will have a plus five charisma modifier and a plus five to every saving throw is basically advantage. It makes your already tanky heavy hitting paladin even tankier and beefs up the rest of your allies as well and becomes even more broken at 18th level when the range of the aura increases to 30 feet. Now we move on to 10th level where you gain an aura of courage that makes you and your allies within 10 feet immune to being frightened. This is a little more niche, but will definitely come in handy and also increases its range to 30 feet at 18th level. Keep in mind that these auras are just always on and don't require you to do anything to use them. And your divine smites only utilize your spell slots as a resource. So you're not burning a bonus action or a reaction to do any of this. And it gets even better at 11th level when your paladin gets an extra 1d8 radiant damage any time they hit a creature with a melee weapon. It's around this point when your paladin becomes a linchpin for your party's damage output and survivability in combat. So while taking all the attention and keeping your party members from failing saves, your paladin will also be blowing up every threat on the battlefield and delivering big time on social encounters as well. At 14th level, paladins will get their final base class feature in Cleansing Touch that allows them to use an action to end one spell on themselves or a willing creature they can touch charisma modifier times per long rest. Sure, this isn't an always on ability and it does use your action, but being able to just outright end a spell on yourself or an ally is pretty powerful in its own right. And at 17th level, when you get access to fifth level spell slots, if you have somehow managed to save a few for actual spells, you may wanna consider taking some other entries like Find Steed, Revivify, Holy Weapon, and Destructive Smite. But even that aside, in other class guides, I've put special emphasis on certain subclasses as being more broken than others. I haven't done as much of that here for one simple reason. The subclasses are all good, but none of them are particularly broken. With Paladin, the base class is what breaks the mold. In that respect, every Paladin is broken. Every Paladin can tank, smite, protect, and riz up NPCs better than most other classes in the game, and they do it so effortlessly that you may even forget how lucky you are not to have limiting factors on any of those abilities. But what do you think is the most cracked part of the Paladin class in 5e? Be sure to let me know down in the comments and don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more guides like this as we roll into the next edition of D&D in 2024. Now, as always, go out there and make some chaos.